And today he'll be talking to us about a really ambitious multi-investigator project that's been going on for some time. Thank you very much. I, I note that today is Valentine's Day, and I've long and admired the Center for Population Biology, and so I, I just wanted to ask you if you could my Valentine. Save me one. I didn't expect so many people, and they won't go around. Save me one. I appreciate it. Uh, so. One thing is that I have a, we have a, a website that represents this project. It's got a large video menu with about 53 short videos that explain what we do and how we do it and why we do it. And it's intended as a public outreach gesture. If you want to see great scenery, you can look at it. If you ever want it for teaching purposes, you, you might want to, want to look at it and, and consider making its use. I also once saw Billy Graham sell his brother-in-law's shoes from the podium. And I figure if he could do that, then I could do this. I wrote a book recently about the origin of species and, and wrote it to make what the origin was accessible to a more general audience, in part by putting it in a stream of science and talking about what was happening in biology at the time the origin was written and how it departed from what was routine fare at the time, and then also explain how it changed the course of science thereafter. Another interesting thing that I learned is you would think that we had long since mined all the good ideas in the origin of species, and the fact is we haven't. There are many very important and interesting ideas there that have yet to be considered and, and investigated. So if you're interested in the origin, I recommend that. Now, in the early 1960s, the dominant question in the discipline of ecology was what controls the abundance and distribution of organisms? And an outgrowth of answering that question was the famous divide between density-dependent versus density-independent population growth. And in turn, an outgrowth of that controversy was the emergence of evolutionary ecology as a named discipline. And it actually dates to this paper by Gordon Orians, who was inspired by the confrontation he saw at the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium five years earlier. Now, in this essay, what Orians does is to divide ecology up into two <coughs> sub-disciplines. Functional ecology corresponds to what had been density independent population re uh, regulation, and it represents a way of studying the abundance and distribution of organisms from a proximate perspective. And what that means is looking at the physiological tolerance of the organism and how that maps on the physical environment in which the organism is found. He then named as an alternative evolutionary ecology, and that was intended to be an ultimate explainer of abundance and distribution. And the idea was that we should understand these things in terms of organismal adaptations, and the chief feature of the environment that they were adapting to was their interactions with other organisms. And this, he said, you know, in a sense, conceptually took the place of density-dependent population regulation. Now, what's less known is that evolutionary ecology actually emerged in two distinct forms in the early 1960s. One of those forms was well represented in this essay by G. Evelyn Hutchinson. And what he argued in this essay is that ecology presents a template. It creates a theater that shapes how organisms adapt. It shapes their, their adaptations and, and what they're like. And one of the peculiar features of this particular approach of ecology governing evolution is that the theory and the empirical work that developed around it implicitly assumed that organisms do not evolve. And it's not because they didn't think organisms do not evolve, but rather that they're taking the perspective that physicists take with regard to relativity, which is that we can safely ignore it much of the time because it happens on such a different time frame from ecology. Ecology is fast and evolution is slow. And we invoke evolution as a way of interpreting the patterns that we see when we study ecology, but not necessarily as a process that we expect to see in action. The alternative was encapsulated actually a year before Orians' essay in this paper by David Pimentel. And again, at the time, all these arguments were couched in terms of density-dependent versus density-independent population uh, regulation. I'll, I call this eco-evo interactions. But he described it as a density, a population regulation genetic feedback mechanism. And so what he argued is that population density, when organisms increase in population density, they change their environment as a consequence of their numbers. And when they do that, they change the kind of selection that they experience 
and then they in turn evolve in response to their impact on the environment. So he saw ecology and evolution as being two actors on the same stage in a constant state of interaction. He developed models to, to develop this idea. He even did experiments that showed it in action in a laboratory model system that involved flies and, and parasitoid uh, wasps. Historically, what happened is that the Hutchinsonian perspective prevailed and became what we call evolutionary ecology, and Pemetel's perspective languished. It was always there, and you can find it in the background, but it doesn't represent the mainstream of evolutionary ecology. Until recently, it now has reemerged. And for me, one paper that made it reemerge and made me think more seriously about Pimentel's perspective was this paper by Yoshida et al. and a series of other papers that came out of Nelson Harson's laboratory at Cornell. What you're looking at are the results of the same experiment done in a chemostat, a, an artificial mesocosm, and what they were looking at were predator prey oscillations. This upper set of experiments were set up where you had a single clone of algae paired with a rotifer. And what happens is that initially the algae are abundant and the rotifers are rare. And then as the rotifers increased in abundance, the algae declined in abundance and then eventually bottomed out. And then with some time lag, the rotifer population declined. And as the rotifer population declined, the algal population recovered. And so you get this, these out of phase oscillations between predators and prey. And these can be described with precise mathematical detail. And the description includes a prediction of what the amplitude of the cycle will be, what the period of the cycle will be, and the degree to which the peaks and the valleys of hosts and, and food are offset from one another. I'm sorry, predators and prey are offset from one another. This is the same experiment done in the same chemostats with one added complexity. Instead of initiating the experiment with a single clone of algae, they initiated it with multiple clones of algae. And when they did that, they created the minimalist circumstances that are required for evolution. Evolution can happen as a change in the relative abundance of one clone of algae in comparison to the others. And you can think of these populations of algae as consisting of two different types. One type is competitively superior but susceptible to predation. And the alternative type is competitively inferior but resistant to predation. So here at the beginning of the cycle, as the predators are increasing in abundance and the prey are declining in abundance, the prey population is also evolving because the relative abundance of the competitively superior clone is declining, and the, but the predator resistant competitively inferior clone is increasing and coming to dominate the population. And as it does, the predator population will decline, and as it declines and the prey population recovers, it also evolves because now the competitively superior clone becomes relatively more abundant in the population. So what we have is a intermingling of ecology and evolution. And the important thing is that when that happens, with that simple added complexity, everything changes. The amplitude of the cycles change, the periods of the cycle change, and the degree to which the peaks and troughs of the predators and their prey are offset from one another change. So this said that at least in these circumstances, ecology and evolution do indeed interact with one another. And that brings me to my definition of what I call an eco-evo interaction. And that is that such interactions occur when the evolution of a participant in an ecological interaction causes a change in the nature of the outcome. Or alternatively, if an organism modifies its environment and hence the selection it experiences, causing it to evolve to a different <coughs> endpoint. These are two different ways of looking at the same phenomenon. So, what I was interested in, what motivated me, was that the dominant theory and empirical studies that define evolutionary ecology don't include this kind of interaction. As I said, they implicitly assume that organisms do not evolve because they treat them as constants. But what I have shown and what many other people have shown over the past few decades is that evolution can be very rapid and that it happens on a time frame or time scale that's comparable to the rate of ecological interactions. And so it becomes very reasonable to ask again whether or not eco evo interactions are a dominant feature of natural communities. And I emphasize here the word nature because most of what we know about these interactions is from theory or from model ecosystems. And what I was interested in is asking whether or not these things can be characterized in natural ecosystems and if they can, if they have an important impact. The next question is, why should we care? Why is this an important thing? In particular, why should NSF have given me so much money to do this? 
And the answer is that eco-evo interactions change the outcome of both ecology and evolution. And if they are indeed prevalent in nature, and if we can master how to characterize them, then there's the potential that ecology and evolution can both emerge as more precise and more predictive disciplines. And so there's a good incentive to want to see if this is an important feature of natural environments. So that's chapter one. Chapter two are guppies, and I call this photograph Guppy Gothic. It was taken by one of my collaborators, Paul Benton Benson, in a natural stream in Trinidad. This is a male guppy and this is a female guppy. And the first important feature of guppy biology is that they're highly dimorphic. The females are a uniform dull color pattern. Males are brightly colored and very polymorphic in color. These are small fish. A female is about 20 millimeters long. A male is about 15 millimeters long. They have a short generation time. The time between when a female is born and when she first gives birth to a litter of young, it can be as little as 10 weeks. They're live bearers, so the female gives birth to young that are like miniature adults and be cultured in the lab like adults. And the probability of rearing them from birth to adulthood in a laboratory setting can be close to 100%, which means that you can do experiments on them in the lab when you want to characterize genetic differences between populations and do them without any fear that death during the raising process is selective death and that, that what you're looking at might not represent a natural gene pool. And they're very easy to breed in the laboratory. Everyone knows that guppies are, are good pet fish. The other thing is that guppies are very good animals for field research, as you'll see in a moment. The place where I do my work is in the northern range mountains of Trinidad. In these mountains, this represents a large river. So Trinidad is what I describe of as a toy wilderness. Everything is on a small scale in comparison to what you might be used to in the United States. This forest gets on the order of three to four meters of rain per year, which means that if I'm there during the rainy season, I can, within the space of a long weekend, see as much rain as I would see in Riverside in an entire year. And it often feels like I've been transplanted to a new world, to a rain planet, if you will, in comparison to what I'm used to at home. But it's also a very beautiful setting for doing work. What I'm interested in in Trinidad is the contrast between two different types of communities where you can find guppies. One is what I refer to as a high predation community, and the alternative is a low predation community. In high predation communities, you can find guppies co-occurring with these types of fish. Um, and all of these are predators on guppies, and all of them, when they feed on guppies, will prey preferentially on large adult size classes. Some of them prey on much larger fish can actually hurt you. A guppy in a fish tank with one of these animals, this is a pike cichlid, will have a half-life of about a second. These guys are very good at catching guppies in those settings. If you go to a natural environment, it turns out that guppies are very good at evading these predators, mostly because of how they school and how they can protect themselves from predators or sense the presence of predators. So these fish only eat about a half a guppy to a guppy per day, we estimate from our, our mark recapture work. But even that is a sufficient increment of mortality for these animals to have a substantial impact on, on guppy biology. I should say, if I can go back. I'll go for it. Okay. In low predation localities, this is the only fish that co-occurs with guppies. It's a killifish. It's got a small terminal mouth. It's an omnivore. When it feeds on guppies, it tends to feed on small, immature size classes. This slide represents about the first 15 years of my career. And what I was interested in at that point was to take life history theory as it first emerged in the 1970s and to use guppies as an empirical system in which I could test the predictions of that theory. What I learned during this work was that guppies from high predation communities where they suffer higher mortality rates mature at an earlier age, reproduce more often, develop more of their consumed resources to making babies and tend to produce more and smaller offspring. And that all these differences are as were predicted by life history theory. We also documented many other features of adaptation to life with and without predators that included things like shape, coloration, behavior, and performance. In addition, it was possible to do experimental evolution, and that's something I'll talk about in a minute. Now this cartoon is meant to give you a, I hope, indelible image of the differences between guppies from high and low predation environments. And it's actually parameterized on real data, and the point is that these differences are not subtle. In high predation environments, the females are smaller when they mature, and they produce many small babies. In low predation environments, the females are larger when they mature, and they produce few large babies. And as I said, this represents real data. It's parameterized on real data. Another interesting feature of guppies in Trinidad is that 
On the south slope of the Northern Range, the crest line runs on an east-west axis, and here are a number of rivers that flow roughly parallel to one another. And what you can see, coated in red and then blue, is the contrast between guppies living with predators in red and without predators in blue. And the point is that this contrast is repeated again and again in a series of streams that run roughly <coughs> parallel to one another. And we can show with genetics that at least some of these represent independent occurrences in which guppies have adapted to life either with or without predators. And so we have a naturally replicated experiment. On the northern slope, we again have a series of rivers which have high and low predation, but we use different colors to code them because the composition of this predator, the other community is entirely different. You're looking at fish that are derived from ocean ancestors, whereas here you're looking at fish that are derived from what you see in the freshwater rivers of South America. But in spite of the fact that the predators are all different species, the life history patterns are the same, which makes a good argument for that predators have played an important role in shaping the life histories, and mortality in particular is, is important. Here you're looking at representative male guppies from a high predation locality and a low predation locality on the Aripo River. And again, the point of this slide is that these differences are substantial differences. They're not at all subtle. Behind all the experiments that I've done, when I conclude that there are evolutionary differences, genetic differences between natural populations of guppies, are two different types of data. One type of data represents fish that were collected in nature, preserved, and then I dissected them and characterized the life histories. The second type of data is from a setting like this, where I collect adult females and put each female, one per aquarium, and take advantage of an important feature of guppy reproductive biology, which is that mature females continuously reproduce and they store sperm. So each female by herself produces a succession of litters that become a numbered pedigree in a series of laboratory experiments and I'll rear them through multiple generations in a common environment and then compare them in a fashion that allows me to conclude that the differences among populations have a genetic basis. I won't always remember to say this in the talk that I give, but this is always behind the statement that there are genetic differences among these populations and that the populations have evolved. Another feature of streams in Trinidad is that they're flowing through a steep tropical terrain that gets a lot of rain, which means that it's highly eroded. And most of these streams are flowing through very steep ravines, and they're very frequently punctuated by waterfalls like this one. And in some cases, you can find settings where guppies are living with predators down here, and guppies are living without predators up here. Because guppies are much more effective at breaching these barriers than are predators. And it means that you can make the same paired comparison between a high and low predation community in localities that are within tens of meters of one another and that are identical to one another with respect to the physical environment, save for the presence or absence of predators. And they still are different in all the ways that would characterize guppies from high and low predation environments throughout the watershed. And again, that kind of difference over this kind of barrier is a good indication that it's the presence or absence of something above or below the barrier that's causing the changes in guppies that we see. Okay, this makes it possible to do an experiment. I've done experiments in which I treat rivers as if they were giant test tubes by taking advantage of these barriers as defining areas where I can introduce either guppies or predators and do experiments in the real world. One type of experiment that I do is characterized by this side of the slide, where I have a barrier waterfall that stops predators and guppies, so that over the barrier waterfall, only one species of fish is present, and that's the killifish that's characteristic of a low predation environment. This setting is represented in many small streams throughout a lot of these watersheds, and it happens because the killifish is the ecological equivalent of a salamander. On rainy nights, it will jump out of the stream, hop across the forest floor. It's believed that they can feed outside of water, and they'll invade aquatic environments wherever they're found. So what I was able to do in this kind of setting was to take guppies from the high predation site below the barrier and introduce them into the previously guppy-free site above the barrier, and then follow their evolution by using their ancestors as a control. In this type of setting, I had a barrier that stopped predators but not guppies, and so what I was able to do was to take predators from below the barrier and introduce them into what had previously been a low predation environment above the barrier and allow the predators to extend their range to the next waterfall in line and in that way increase the mortality risk that guppies experience. And in both of these types of experiments, I showed that the life histories evolved, again, as predicted by life history theory and as seen across the comparative framework of natural streams and that many of these traits could have evolved in as little as four, four to five years. 
Okay, life was good for about 15 years in the sense that everything that I found very neatly fit with the predictions of this early generation of life history theory that modeled how life history should evolve in response to differences in age-specific mortality. And then I made a series of observations that in their own way were not consistent with the patterns that I was seeing. And they caused me to wonder what else what might be going on. And I'll talk about three of these types of data right here. Okay, the first thing I did was to measure mortality rates by doing mark recapture on natural populations of guppies. It was a pretty good bet that when guppies look with predators, they suffer a higher risk of mortality. But it was important to know exactly what the nature of the mortality risk differences were between high and low predation environments. And so I came up with a way of marking guppies. I tried a couple of different things that didn't work, but eventually I developed a method where I would inject dots of, of paint subcutaneously and in that way tattoo them so I could recognize them as individuals. Originally I used acrylic latex paints that I got at art stores and it was then that I discovered that colorful names like cadmium red and cyano blue have biological significance. They're not good for guppies. They don't grow very well when you use them. So I consulted with an artist friend who actually was a, a boyhood friend who I had met hunting rattlesnakes when I was 15 and he was my field assistant for my first five or six years as an assistant professor, but he could advise me on what colors are not toxic, and, and so we made that work. <clears throat> but then a company came along and invented this for me. It's a marking method that is started with an elastomer that was developed for human surgical implants, so it's hypoallergenic, and then they colorize it and sell it for fantastic amounts of money so that people can do mark recapture studies on fish and aquatic invertebrates. And right now I'm working with 10 colors. I mark eight different positions on a fish's body and I put two marks per fish and then I can use the same marks for males and females. And if you multiply up that combinatorics, what it means is that I'm able to follow thousands of individuals within a population and recognize them as individuals. This is the kind of accommodation we have when we're doing extended mark recapture in the field. And this is one of my favorite inventions for field work. It's a Hennessy hammock, which has a built-in mosquito netting and a rain fly. And the thing that's nice about it is that I discovered early in my career that sleeping on the ground in the tropics can invite strange bedfellows. And so it's nice to be off the ground and it's easier to get up in the morning. This is the kind of stream where and we can do our best mark recapture work. And this stream has what's called a pool riffle structure. So in the foreground is a pool, and in the pool is bounded either upstream or downstream by a riffle. Riffles are an area where the gradient is steeper and the water is flowing in a straight line. When the water hits the pool, it's broken up into turbulence, and then there are parts of the pool where there's no current at all. And the stream as a whole is structured like a staircase. So you have a riffle, pool, riffle, pool, riffle, pool. And what I discovered early in my career working on guppies is that guppies like to stay in pools and they're disinclined to move from one pool to the other. The other thing I found is that it was possible to extract every single guppy out of a pool in a relatively brief period of time without doing anything to disturb the habitat. And the way I did that was to adopt a guppy collecting method that I learned from John Endler. If you know John, you know that he'll find passive ways of doing things. And what you do is you hold a butterfly net in each hand and position yourself at the upstream end of the pool and perhaps stir up a little bit of sediment. Most fish will run and hide. For guppies, it's like a magnet. They'll come swimming towards you because they want to see if there's anything good to eat in that sediment. And then you can just play them from one net to the other and extract every single one out of the pool without ever entering the pool or disturbing the habitat, which is important if you want to do repeated mark recapture. It's important to sample your animal without disturbing the habitat. Um, what we then do is treat a pool as a sampling unit, or as a deem, if you will, in the way a population geneticist would think of a deem. We'll collect everyone in the pool, bottle it up, bring it back to the lab, measure them, mark them as individuals, return them to the site of capture, and we'll do this for a series of adjacent pools and do it month after month. And the kind of information that you accumulate makes it possible to assemble a life table for the population because you can look at the probability of survival is a function of the probability of recapture. You can look at growth rate, emigration, and recruitment. Recruitment is the appearance of small unmarked individuals that grew up and became large enough to mark since the prior month census. What you're looking at here is the, my first goal in doing mark recapture, and that was to ask, do guppies from high predation environments really do suffer higher risks of mortality? 
And furthermore, is it the case, this is uh, survival on the y-axis and this is size or age on the x-axis. The other important detail was that the difference between high and low predation should become magnified in the larger and older size classes because the predators we presumed were eating large guppies and therefore the risk of mortality should increase as the animals got larger and older. And that was an important part of the theory that I was using for making predictions. This is what we actually found. This is based upon 14 experiments, 14 market capture efforts done, seven each in high and low predation environments. And we found that the high predation guppies do in fact have lower probabilities of survival than guppies from low predation environments. But in fact, the lines are dead parallel to one another. That the presence of predators increases risk of mortality, but that increment is equally spread across all age and size classes. Now an interesting feature of the early life history theory was that if increased mortality is, incre is evenly distributed across all age classes, the prediction is that the animal will not evolve. It's not going to make any difference. It's evolutionarily neutral. And that made me unhappy for a while, but then I realized that I'd already seen them evolve. I'd already done my experiments and shown that I can transplant guppies from a high to a low predation environment. They will evolve to match what I see in my comparative studies very quickly. And so then the real question was, why did they evolve the way they did? I went to the library. There was much more life history theory available at that point. And there are other versions that showed that this mortality pattern could, in fact, select for the patterns that I saw, but only if you added ecological complexity, specifically only if you added something like density regulation, and particular types of density regulation to the model. Another thing that I became interested in was senescence. And the reason is because guppies from high predation environments that suffer higher mortality rates also begin to reproduce when they're younger, and they put more of their resources into reproduction. And what the theory for the evolution of senescence predicts is that those animals should also age more quickly. The acceleration in mortality, in intrinsic mortality risk, should be higher. They should have shorter lifespans. Their reproductive performance should decline more quickly than in their counterparts from environments where the risk of mortality is low. And so the question is, what is the longevity of these animals? And this is something that you evaluate in the laboratory, in a common environment, outside of the risk of predation. And the answer was very dramatically not what had been predicted. It turns out that the high predation guppies had longer lifespans. They had lower risks of mortality, or lower mortality rates throughout their lives. They lived to more advanced ages. They had higher rates of reproduction throughout their lives. And they continued to reproduce to greater ages than did their low predation counterparts, which was, you know, just says that they were flat out better guppies than guppies from low predation environments. I often describe them as being super guppies. And the dilemma, even though it was a very interesting result, is that if all this is true, then the low predation life history should never evolve, because that's an animal that just has lower fitness than the high predation animal. And so it created a, a, a dilemma. Now, at this point, I felt that what I needed was a motto. We've just had a presidential election, and so you know what mottos are. Mottos are short phrases, one to three words, like we built it or change, which capture the spirit of the moment and are meant to, to, to motivate people. And so my motto became fear no data. <laughs> and the point of the statement was that I was confident in these data. I was confident that I'd done good experiments. There were well-replicated experiments. The results were consistent wherever I looked. And however disturbing the results might be, they were real results. And there was something that I had to learn how to deal with and, and reconcile if I were to understand why it is that guppies were evolving the way they were. Okay, the third type of data that I had are ones that were collected on the same populations where I was measuring mortality rate. Because at the same time that I did that, I looked at the comparative ecology of these populations. And one of the things that I found was that the biomass of guppies per unit area in high predation localities was much, much lower than in low predation localities. It was about a, between a quarter and a fifth of what you'd see in a low predation environment. So there are many more guppies to be found there. I also found that there are differences in the size distribution. High predation populations are dominated by small, young fish. Low predation populations, the open bars, are more even in their size and age distribution. And that's a simple consequence of their demography. High predation guppies make lots of babies and they have short, low life expectancy. The other thing I found was that the high predation guppies have higher growth rates than do guppies from low predation environments. And the best explanation for that difference was that they had more food. Collectively, what these data suggested is that I might be looking at indirect effects of predators. Predators kill guppies, but at the same time, what they do is depress guppy population density, and apparently they increase 
per capita food availability so that those guppies that survive grow faster, they have more babies, and they have many more babies than you would see in a laboratory common environment where they're getting the same amount of food. Um, and, and, and so they have increased resource availability. Conversely, when you take a predator out of the system, population density increases, per capita resource availability declines, and, uh, and, and so guppies have to, have to deal with less. Okay, this brings me to the argument for eco-evo interactions, which is that in order to understand or to reconcile the kinds of patterns of evolution that I saw with the environments in which I found the guppies, I had to invoke ecological complexity. I had to invoke the idea that there might be density regulation or indirect effects of predators. Both of these kinds of complexity have been incorporated into models of evolution of lifespan or evolution of life histories and they could reconcile the sort of patterns that I saw. But what it made me want to know is what exactly is density regulation? And what I decided is that density regulation is a black box that's created by evolutionary biologists that says if you pack more of your animal into the environment, something changes, and whatever it might be, it also changes the kind of selection that the animal experiences. What I decided, if I really wanted to know what density regulation was, was that I needed to form a partnership with ecosystems <coughs> ecologists. And for me, this was a, a major step because up until this point in time ecosystems ecology was for me like a dark cloud on a horizon because these guys got all these gigantic grants and I was terribly jealous of them and I didn't understand what they were doing or why it was useful and then I realized that well one of the things they're doing is really giving us intricately intricately detailed descriptions of how ecosystems work and that having that kind of information in a partnership to study guppy populations could tell me something about what things like indirect effects of predators and density regulation actually were. And so this brought me to the conceptual framework for what I proposed to the NSF, which was to resolve the whole interaction into two questions and ask first if evolution influences ecology, and then secondly, whether or not the influence of organisms on their environment changes the kind of selection that they experience and influences how they evolve and adapt to that environment. One approach that we took, which was represented by dissertation work by Ron Basser, is what I refer to as retrospective evolution. And you'll see what I mean by that in just a minute. But all of this work was done in artificial streams. And the kinds of questions we addressed was, were, do guppies change their ecosystem? Which is an important prerequisite for there to be eco-evo interactions. In order for such an interactions to reshape how organisms evolve, the organisms actually have to have a measurable impact on the structure of their ecosystem. The second question is whether or not there's evidence for density-dependent evolution in guppies. And the third was to look at the interaction between guppies and the killifish in the context of a, a low predation environment. Okay, these are the artificial streams that we work with. They were conceived of and built by Doug Fraser, who is one of the co-PIs on the project. And what happens is behind these artificial streams and behind this canopy is a real stream. And up over here is a spring whose output normally would run into this real stream. But instead, what we do is divert it into this tank. And from the tank, we then gravity feed it to all the artificial streams. And it then flows back into the natural <coughs> stream. So it just represents a, a diversion of the natural flow of the stream. And by setting them up next to real streams, they're naturally colonized by the vertebrates that are found in the real stream. And our ecosystems colleagues showed that we're able to set up reasonable facsimiles of, art, of natural streams in these artificial channels. And it's here that we did factorial experiments. One of our early experiments involved taking guppies from a low predation environment and a high predation environment, and then keeping them at low and high population densities. And an important thing about these densities is that we were able to parameterize them on what real densities are in natural low and high predation environments. Because you have to remember, we did comparative ecology. And so we knew a lot of what, about what the natural setting was like. And for every experiment that we did, we were able to parameterize it by the sorts of values that you would see in a natural setting. And then we were able to f do things like follow the growth rates of the guppies and see whether or not the response of the animals was, again, within the range of values that you would see in a natural setting. We also had a different treatment, which was to have channels that contained no guppies at all. Okay, this is one of the results that we got. On the y-axis is the standing crop of algae. And what you're looking at here are the four treatments that contain guppies, and this is the one treatment that didn't contain guppies. So the average of these four versus this one tells you that if you put guppies in the ecosystem, they severely depress the abundance of algae. This is a log scale, so the difference is a, a very large difference. 
If you compare the red lines with the blue lines, this is high predation and this is low predation, and it turns out that the low predation guppies sub suppressed algal abundance substantially more and significantly more than the guppies from high predation environments, and this is high density versus low density, and higher density again resulted in a greater depression of algal abundance. And all of these effects are significant and are additive. Now I have to admit that when I proposed these experiments, I didn't believe that anything would happen. I did not believe that guppies would have an impact on their ecosystem. I really thought that they were neat animals, I could study their, their evolution, but they were like ornaments on the system, because they're just too small, and there are too few of them to make a difference. What you're looking at here is that they make a huge difference. This is a method that one of my ecosystems colleagues uh, included. And what you're looking at here is a copper coil. And this copper coil is attached to a fence line charger that puts a weak electric pulse through it about every second. And what that pulse does is, is, is prevent guppies from entering that area, but it doesn't prevent any of the invertebrates from going in. And then this is a control. And so what you're seeing is what the absence of guppies after two weeks does to the ecosystem. What happens is that guppies are constantly grooming the surface of the gravel, and they're constantly cleaning it of sediment and cleaning it of algae, and that when you take that effect away, the environment is very quickly coated with this carpet of gold, golden brown diatoms. Here's the same experiment done in a natural stream, and the point is that as much as possible, we replicate everything in natural streams, because we want to make sure that what we're looking at is not an artifact of the artificial stream. And as you can see, this is the electrified one, this is the unelectrified one, that we get very similar results. Okay, here you're looking at invertebrate abundance in the artificial streams. And again, if you look at the average of these four points versus this one, you'll see that guppies depress the abundance of invertebrates. But if you look at the red versus the blue, you'll see that high predation guppies depress invertebrate abundance to a far greater degree than guppies from low predation environments. After the experiment was done, we preserved all the fish, we dissected them, we looked in their stomachs, and what it showed is that these differences in the impact of high and low predation guppies on the ecosystem were largely driven by diet differences. The high, this is invertebrate abundance, and the guppies from the high predation environments had much more in the way of invertebrates in their stomachs than those from low predation environments. This is diatom abundance, and it, the guppies from low predation environments had much more in the way of diatoms in their guts than the guppies from high predation environments. And there, so there are differences in diet. It turns out that there are cascading differences throughout the rest of the ecosystem. So for example, high predation guppies eat the invertebrates that shred leaves, and so the rate at which leaves were decomposing and there was a buildup of benthic organic matter differed very often between high and low predation environments. And there are other sorts of impacts on, on the structure of the ecosystem. Now, important thing is that we did this entire experiment twice. We did it once with guppies from high and low predation environments in the Arico River, and we did the whole thing all over again with guppies from high and low predation environments in the Guanapo River, and we got the same results in each of them. And by doing it twice, we create an independent degree of freedom that characterizes high versus low predation environments, as opposed to characterizing guppies from two different localities. And so the point is that this result is a repeatable one. <coughs> Okay, what these results show is that guppies influence their community. Guppies of any type change the ecosystem, but guppies that are adapted to these alternative environments have different impacts on the structure of the ecosystem, and those differences are largely caused by differences in diet. Okay, this is a second analysis of the same experiment. And here we're just looking at the guppy treatments. Guppies from high and low predation, from high and low population density, and what Ron did at this point was to apply an integral population model to the data, which involved taking all the life history data that we could look, collect on fish in the channel. We knew about their growth rates, we knew about their mortality rates, we knew about their birth rates, and from that you could construct a life table and generate an estimate of population growth rate of each type of guppy at each population density. And that represents, I think, a good point estimate of their, of their relative fitness. And this is what he found, that at low population densities, the guppies from the high predation environments had significantly higher fitness than their counterparts from low predation environments. So in those conditions, they really are the super guppy, and they really would displace a low predation guppy very readily. But that at high population densities, these differences in fitness disappeared. And so what this suggests is that part of the difference between the high and low predation phenotype is adaptation to high population densities, that the relative fitnesses are, are, 
are, are equal in that setting, and they're not at all equal at low population densities. But this is not enough of an explanation. For the low predation phenotype to evolve, they have to be better. And so there has to be more going on. So in conclusion, high predation guppies have higher fitness at low population densities, but these differences in fitness disappear at high population densities. Okay, what you're looking at here is the structure of natural fish communities in Trinidad. This is a high predation environment where you have the predators and you have the killifish and you have guppies. This is a barrier waterfall that excludes the predators, so you just have the killifish and guppies. And the point is that when the predators are gone, they're, the guppies and the killifish are, are much more abundant. Then this is a barrier waterfall that excludes guppies, and what happens when you take guppies out of the system is that the killifish become much more abundant. And so we use these kinds of values to parameterize a new experiment. And what we did in this experiment was to model an invasion. What we know happens in nature is that high predation guppies breach waterfalls and invade previously guppy-free low predation environments. And in that setting, the low predation phenotype evolves. So in this experiment, we had one set of treatments which just had the killifish from, and they were taken from a locality that only had killifish present. The second treatment looks at the early phases of a guppy invasion, so that we paired high predation guppies at a high density that's typical of that kind of environment with rivulets that had been dry from a stream that only had rivulets. Then we imagined what it would look like if the guppies evolved, so we paired guppies from a low predation environment with rivulets again from a stream that only contained rivulets, and then we modeled what would happen when the rivulets evolved, so that we compared guppies from a low predation environment with rivulets that had come from a low predation environment that normally lived with and presumably were co-adapted to living with guppies. What you're looking at here is the relative fitness of guppies in the three different guppy settings. And this is the, and this is again from an application of the integral projection models. And this is the relative fitness of high predation guppies when they're paired with rivulets from a rivulets only environment. And this is the relative fitness of low predation guppies in the same kind of setting. And what we find is that now the low predation phenotype has higher fitness than does the high predation phenotype. And so if you combine high population density with killifish that are normally present in that environment, we now create a circumstance in which the low predation phenotype has higher fitness. But the interesting thing is that when the low predation phenotype is paired with co-evolved Rivulus, we find that their fitness increases yet again. And what this suggests is that we might be actually looking at ecological character divergence in some way. We didn't expect to see this result. And the other important point is that this result was duplicated. We did it twice with guppies from high and low predation environments and rivulets from low predation environments and rivulets and only environments in one river system. And then we took it all down and we did it a second time from a second river system. And we got the same results each time. So it's a, re a repeatable pattern. And so what this says is that the low predation guppies have higher fitness than high predation guppies in the presence of rivulets, and that they have even higher fitness in the presence of, of co-evolved rivulets. Okay, what these data collectively suggest is that the community shapes evolution, that the reason the low predation phenotype evolves is in part as a consequence of density. There's evidence of density dependent evolution and also as a consequence of their interaction with the other fish species that's present in that environment. And if you put the two together, this collection of experiments fulfills the full cycle of e evolution influencing ecology and then it be changed ecology feeding back on and influencing evolution. But as I said, this is retrospective evolution. This is based upon doing experiments with the endpoints of the evolutionary process and trying to piece together what had happened with a collection of experiments and different combinations of phenotypes from these different environments. But we can do better than that in this system. We can also do prospective evolution because we can do experiments and manipulate the environment and try to look at the interaction between ecology and evolution in real time. And that's what we did in this particular experiment. And Andres Lopez Sepulcra is the master of this particular data set. What we did was to take guppies from a single high predation locality and introduce them into four guppy-free headwater streams within the same drainage. Okay, we worked in the Guanapo drainage on the south slope of the Northern Range Mountains, and we worked in these four different tributaries of the Guanapo drainage. And each of these tributaries shared 
the same properties, which is that at the base of the tributary was a barrier waterfall that excluded all species of fish except for the killifish. All these streams were guppy free, and upstream from the barrier waterfall were other waterfalls that were of a sufficient magnitude that we felt that they would contain guppies. <coughs> My colleagues who were evaluating the ecosystem and studying the population biology of the killifish studied, did those things in the, what would be the control site and the introduction site for an entire year. And at the end of that year, we introduced guppies. And what we did was to create an experimental treatment and control treatment. In the experimental treatment, we now have guppies. And then the control treatment is upstream from where the guppies would be found and remained guppy free. And so what that meant is that we could look at the impact of guppies in two different ways. One is a contemporary comparison between experimental and controls. And the other is a time series of what happened after the guppies were, were introduced. Okay, an important feature is the nature of the guppies that we introduced. They all came from a high tradition locality on the Guanaco River, and they were chosen based on a prior knowledge of their life history patterns and other features that said that they're typical of guppies from a high predation locality. So we typed them in advance, and we also chose them on the basis of their high genetic diversity. These animals were collected as juveniles and reared to adulthood in separate sex groups, and that's important because it meant that we knew every single founder. The alternative might be to take a wild caught female and put her in, which means that she'd come in with stored sperm, which means that there would be a bunch of fathers that we didn't know. And we wanted to know everyone. We raised them all to maturity. We photographed them all. We, in, we marked them to recognize them as individuals. And then from all of them, we collected some scales to serve as a source of DNA. Another thing that happened is that there's now a genome sequence that's being assembled for this founder population. And that's something that we think might be useful in the future. Okay, what we then did was to census them every single month. And in every single month, when we census these populations, we have about a 90% probability of seeing every single fish if it's alive. And what we did was to look at every marked fish, confirm who it was, record where it was found, measure it, weigh it, then return it to the site of capture. And for every new recruit, meaning every unmarked individual that's 14 millimeters long or larger, and that's just below the threshold of when they're attaining sexual maturity, we marked them as individuals. We again photographed, measured them, and gave them a new mark so that we could recognize them as in individuals in all future captures. The aggregate probability of seeing every single adult that matures in these <coughs> populations is greater than 99% based upon our, our mark recapture uh, results. Okay, what we've seen early along is that guppies do, in fact, influence the ecosystem of natural st streams. So the stuff that we saw going on in artificial streams scales up to what we saw in these introductions. And I'll show you those results for invertebrate, invertebrate abundance and rebulus abundance. Okay, what I want you to do first is to concentrate on the open symbols. And these symbols, these squares, represent the abundance of invertebrates per unit area, their biomass, in the control site above where the guppies were introduced. And then these symbols represent their abundance in the site where guppies were introduced. And for the year when they were introduced and the year after they were introduced, there are no differences between the two. But then after two years, as the guppy populations reached their peak, we found that, in fact, the presence of guppies was associated with a substantial and significant reduction in the abundance of invertebrates. Then these black symbols are the second stream of the pair, and they show that the result was repeatable. In both cases, the introduction site with guppies had significantly lower invertebrate abundance than the upstream control. Here you're just looking at a particular category of invertebrates, the gatherers, which turned out to be important to Tom. This is Tom Heatherly, who's a PhD student from the University of Nebraska, who, who did this work. Okay, this work was done by Brad Lampier, who was a postdoc at North Carolina State. And what you're looking at here is the impact of guppies on the size distribution of killifish. This is the introduction site, and this is the control site after a period of about two years. This result for me was a beautiful result because what we were finding, what we had suspected before, is that guppies are playing a different sort of role in the system. Guppies had, up until this time, always been the victim and they were adapting to predators. But it turns out that now guppies are the aggressor. What you're looking at are the consequences of adult guppies eating juvenile killifish, but we think also possibly competing with adolescent killifish. These bars are the percent composition of a given size class in the population. And so what you're seeing is that Guppies crimp the recruitment of young ribulus, and that after two years with guppies, the size distribution has shifted to larger fish because 
the population is now being dominated by adults and there's been very little in the way of recruitment. But what you're looking at here is the relative population density of ribulus in the introduction site versus the control site. In this case, the y-axis is an index that will have a value of zero if there's no difference in population density between the two sites. And you're looking at the first year before guppies were introduced and the values are all clustered around zero. Now you're looking at the four streams after the guppies were introduced. And what we find is that by two years after the introduction of guppies, all four of the introduction sites have significantly lower population densities of killifish than do the upstream controls. These open symbols happen to represent a treatment. These are two streams where we thinned the canopy and in that way increased primary productivity. And what we found is that the impacts of guppies on the killifish were less severe in the presence of higher productivity than in these two streams, which had intact forest canopies and, and lower productivity. Matt Walsh, as part of his PhD work, looked at the evolutionary consequences of living with guppies, and he showed that rivulets that live with guppies are indeed genetically distinct from those that are found upstream where guppies are not present. And the other thing that he showed is that the reason the rivulets evolved was not because guppies were killing rivulets, but rather that it was an indirect consequence of guppies thinning the rivulus population and indirectly increasing food abundance to the rivulus. And what they really were adapting to was having more to eat in the presence of guppies than in the absence of guppies. Okay, the question is, how do we hope to learn whether or not there's an ongoing interaction between ecology and evolution in this context? And this slide represents, at least conceptually, how we could tell the difference between the two. If the only reason guppies evolve when you transplant them from a high predation site to a low predation site is that you change their environment and change their risk of mortality, then at the moment the guppies are introduced <coughs> is when they're going to be most distant from the optimal phenotype for that environment. When they're most distant from the optimal phenotype is when the intensity of selection is going to be the greatest and the rate of evolution will be the greatest. And then as they evolve and they adapt and they move towards that optimum phenotype, you expect and what you predict is sort of an exponential decay in the intensity of selection and in the rate of evolution. If on the other hand, guppies are adapting to things that they do to the environment, if it takes them two years to affect invertebrates and two years to deplete or begin to deplete the ribulus, then that means that initially the environment is changing and it's possible that the intensity of selection will actually increase or it's going to change over the course of time and at least some components of the phenotype are going to have an increase in the intensity of selection over time and then later it will decrease as they adapt to the environment that they changed. And so what we'll be looking for is these differences in shape and the patterns of evolution of different features of the, of the guppy phenotype. I think this slide is obvious to everyone and so I won't explain it. But actually, maybe I will. What you're looking at is the pedigree of these populations. This is an individual from one of our streams, and the red line goes to the individual's mother, and the blue line goes to the individual's father. And what we've been able to do is, for all these individuals, we're plucking scales and we're genotyping them at 10 microsatellite loci that have an average of 20 alleles each. And then Paul Benson and, and Ian Patterson are using that information to reconstruct the pedigrees. And from this information, we're able to find out what individual reproductive success is like. So we can look at evolution not just as a change in mean phenotype over time, but we also can look at it as a consequence of variation in individual reproductive success. And we know who those individuals are. We have photographs of them and other information about them, and we can relate individual reproductive success to those features of the phenotype. Okay, what we have as an end product of this project then is an archive of DNA from every individual in four replicate evolving populations which have two treatments. And I haven't talked about these two treatments, but those are the thinned versus the intact canopy. We have photographs of all these individuals, so we can look at two perspectives of evolution, change in population mean and individual reproductive success. The things that we know are that guppies do indeed change their ecosystem. They deplete resource availability, they reduce rivulous abundance, and that's the first requisite for talking about an interaction between ecology and evolution. The organism has to change its ecosystem. You have to be able to quantify it. We know that the ecosystem impacts evolve, that there are differences between guppies that are adapted to high versus low predation environments and how they utilize the environment and what their impact on the ecosystem is. 
We know that low predation guppies are less selective consumers. Again, that's a result that I didn't show you here. But those differences in diet were a result of high predation guppies selectively preying on invertebrates of high quality as judged by the ratio of carbon to nitrogen in the invertebrate. Low predation guppies are like vacuum cleaners. They're basically just sweeping everything up in their path without any regard to the quality of what they're eating. The other thing we showed was that there's evidence for density dependent selection and it results in low predation phenotypes having equal fitness to high predation phenotypes at high population densities, but no, not low population densities. We've also documented rivulus guppy coevolution, and that it's this added interaction that makes the low predation guppy have a higher fitness than the high predation guppy. And this is not an unusual result. It just says that fitness is context specific. And this is the, the, uh, the demise of the super guppy. Rivulus life history evolution is driven by guppy ecosystem effects, not by the mortality the guppies impose directly on the killifish. The sorts of things that we don't know and that we're working on now are the full impact of guppies on their ecosystem and also whether or not guppy adaptation to low predation streams is in part shaped by their impact on their ecosystem. These are the areas that we partly characterized, but we hope to complete the characterization of in the future. Now the next question you might ask is, okay, if we can do all this, and if we can show eco-evo interactions in guppies in Trinidad, how important is it, and is this just an oddity of guppies that you can show in little headwater streams in Trinidad, or is this a phenomenon that might be generally applicable to other ecosystems? And what this slide is intended to do is to say that it may actually be generally applicable, and that if you want to do this kind of research, you can go to the library and find a catalog of ecosystems where such work can be done. This particular slide is taken from a paper that was published by Estes et al. in Science in 2011. And what you're looking at are ecosystems where predators are present, and then the same ecosystems at some later point in time when the predators were extirpated. And what they are interested in is the consequences of taking out top <coughs> predators. But what I'm interested in is a phenomenon that's been described by ecologists hundreds of times over in many different ecosystems. Every time you see the use of the word trophic cascade, keystone species, or, um, or, or ecosystem engineer, what you're talking about is an example of an organism that has a large measurable impact on its ecosystem. And what we should care about in this context is not that organism, but the other organisms that are found in alternative settings where that organism is either present or absent and how the interactions among those organisms might change and also how they may, might evolve as a consequence of those interactions. And every one of these, and there are hundreds of them in the literature, represents a form which, that you can look to and ask whether or not you can use this as a reasonable way of studying eco-evo interactions in nature. And there are many of them to choose from. Okay, as a final point, this is the guppy predator. And I just wanted to say that they aren't all murderous. These are fish, are, the pike cichlids are actually very good parents. This is a mother pike cichlid guarding her babies, and she'll stay there even if you lean up close to her and take her photograph. But the fathers are, are a little less cautious. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And we assume that this is, you know, this is not the typical pattern. Mostly, usually the zeros would be the most abundant class, and then it would there'd be like an exponential decay. And so what we assume is happening is that this is early and the population's expanding. And one of the things we want to look for is whether or not the shape of this distribution is changing over time. And we can use, you know, can we use it as an index of whether or not we're seeing the advent of, of density regulation in the population? So that's that's something that we're doing right now. And then um, this is paternity by female parent, and the idea is that they're highly promiscuous. We, we knew that before, but now we're looking at it differently, because usually people would collect females, they get the babies, and then they genotype them and figure out how many fathers there were. And what we're looking at here is real reproductive success, because we're looking at babies that are recruited into the adult population, and the picture that's coming out is different from what you see published for these fish. There are many, many more fathers identified with each mother than you would expect, and here is the, the mothers per father, and so it's equally variable from the other side. Uh, but there are differences between the two streams. One, the one with the intact canopy actually showed higher variance in male reproductive sex success than female reproductive success, and the one with the open canopy had equal variance in male and female reproductive success. And that's actually something that we hope to exploit in the grant that we're doing right now. We don't know yet whether that's a, a repeatable feature, but very often the productivity of the environment was having a, an impact or, or helping shape the, the pattern of evolution or other types of responses. Um, two questions. One, do guppies that are more promiscuous seem to have more surviving offsprings than ones that are less so? And also, we, do, I'd like to know that. <laughs> and also, have you noticed if certain types of tattooing have any effect on a fish's reproductive success? We'll be looking at that. I mean, the, the, the tattooing, you know, we know early along that tattooing doesn't affect susceptibility to predation. It may well affect female choice, and, and we'll look. I mean, that was something that we debated for a long time. You know, there's a history for marks on individuals affecting mate choice. Um, our marks are different because they're highly variable, and they're randomly distributed, and, and, and so on. But um, we can find out. And, and, and I decided that whatever evil might be associated with it was more than offset by what we learned by, by being able to recognize them as individuals. But I think that's what you're, you're concerned about. Oh, I was just sort of curious because yeah. Certain marks are either considered absolutely not to be mated with, or certain other ones are considered highly desirable. Yeah, um, that happened. Nancy Burley's work was a famous example where the color of leg band on birds affected mate choice. Um, all of these, I, we'll find out. I mean, that, you know, we, we know that that's an issue, and that's something that that will that's <coughs> analyzable within these data. So, uh, <coughs> so your entire career, you dichotomized this uh, the streams as higher low predation. There's very few things uh, that you can really dichotomize like that. I mean, how do you justify that? This is one question. And secondly, the, um, in both high and low uh, predation streams, it's replacement population in the long term, right? And so that you have equal mortality in both cases. But you say that there's differential uh, fish mortality when you call it predation, but the overall mortality would be the same. No, the mortality rate is much higher in the high predation environment. The populations are turning over faster, and there's a measurable, predictable impact on the age structure that the high predation populations are younger. It's like a third world versus a first world human population. So they're higher reproductive rate. So there's differences in reproductive rate. Um, no, it's a combination of death rate and reproductive rate. Um, but, but they do have a higher death rate. Just not, it's not proportionately higher in some age classes relative to others, is, is what we found. And there is a continuum of communities between high and low predation. We actually now have a publication that shows that there's also a continuum in life histories as you go upstreams. And the nature of that continuum varies among streams. And so for some streams, it's a fairly gradual rise. And, and always pike cichlids drop out first, and other things drop out second, um, so that there's a succession. Other streams actually will have a, a sharp barrier. And, and so it's really is just high versus low without much of a gradient. So the dichotomy that you're seeing is, is in part an artificial dichotomy. When I started doing my work, I was you know, fresh out of my statistics class, and they said if you have a regression, you have limited data that you can collect, and you want to have to see a significant relationship for, for what you're able to do, you lump your data up at the endpoints. And so I lumped them up on the endpoints, and I've continued to do that. So let me one follow up. Out of 100 uh, newborn, how many uh, would die of the fish predation versus all of Cause mortality. I don't know. I mean, that was a question. That's not an important question. Yeah. Well, I mean, if fish predation is a small proportion of the total, 
then that's one thing. If it's, it's, if it's most of the mortality, then that's another. You could argue that what I call a high and low predation environment is just an index of other things, um, and that may be. Because, I mean, the reason I went to mark recapture is I, I kept on getting these questions. What about the birds? What about the invertebrates? What about their relative importance? And those were hard things for, to answer. And so what I decided to do was to measure the mortality rate itself, because, because at least in the theory, it's the mortality rate, and it's the pattern mortality rate that matters. It doesn't really matter who kills you. Um, and, and so I went to doing the, the demography and the mark recapture. Um, and it's, at this point, I, I, you know, based on the relative abundance of the things that I see that eat the guppies, it's probably mostly fish. But in fact, I don't really know proportionately who's killing the guppies. All right, well, following up to that question, you listed a bunch of suction feeding fish predators, but one of the predators you listed in the low predation streams is macrobrachium, the long arm shrimp that are presumably snagging guppies with their claws. Yeah. Did you have populations where macrobrachium are present or absent, and do you see differences in body shape? Oh, well, um, so it turns out the south slope macrobrachium are rare, and I told you earlier, that's a recent thing. I found old distribution data from the 1950s, and macrobrachium were, were much more abundant then, and so the ecosystems I'm studying are not that old. The, the reason they are no longer abundant is because they have a life cycle that involves going in and out to the ocean, and the lower Crony River became polluted, and it, it prevented them from, from recruiting. And so by the time I got there, they were nowhere to be found. But data I found from the 50s said that they had been there. Um, so all the sites on the south slope have a few macrobrachium. All the ones on the north slope have many macrobrachium. And we do have one unpublished result that suggests the macrobrachium do change things. They, um, in, in a site without large predators and macrobrachium, there's a sort of tilt where they're, they're taking more of the smaller, the smaller uh, guppies. And they are good at catching guppies. At first, I thought it would be like catching flies with chopsticks. But it turns out that their claws have very fine, sharp, hair-like structures on them. And we've seen them grab guppies. They're, they're quite good at it. Do you see anything with uh, that sort of parallels what people have seen with dragonfly larvae and stickleback, where say fish with longer fins that are sort of easier to snag? They have longer fins when the predators aren't there, and so you know, they're, you know, it could be that that's because they're they're easier to snag, but also that they're used in display. But I actually don't know that. Um, I do know that they have longer fins. Guppy predators change the uh, behavioral aspects of guppies that might pertain to their fitness or how, or how fast they grow, and so on. So that, for example, that they shorten feeding periods. They shift habitats. The, um, the answer is sort of yes to all those things. Guppies from high predation localities are more inclined to school. Uh, it's a trait that you can see in the grandchildren mm -hmm. reared for two generations without ever seeing a predator. So it seems to have a genetic basis. They will respond to a threat at a greater distance. They're faster. We've shown that they're significantly faster in their response. And we've shown that the increment by which they're faster can make the difference between life and death in a real attack, you know, a real attack. We're looking at things like sea start and early acceleration, you know, and they might be like 10 or 15% faster. And then Jeff Walker set up real trials and looked at whether or not a predator was going to get you. And that, that increment of difference was enough to significantly increase <laughs> their ability to escape the predator. There, uh, the female guppies, a large female guppy will forage out in the middle of the river and school with the tetras. Um, they don't seem to. Um, be deterred by the predators. The smaller fish all hang out in the margins. And so I think the way they use habitat is partly uh, in, or largely influenced by their swimming ability. Does that answer everything? Okay. Yeah. So you've done the experiment where you take them out of the high predation environment and low, low predation environment, and then you've done the reverse of that as well uh, in a separate stream. Have, have you done the experiment where on the same population you do, you take them out of hybridation, look at the evolutionary change, and then reintroduce the predator to see within the same population if, if there's a reversal? Oh, uh, we had one set up where I was, I was, where I tried to do that and did not succeed because the, it turns out that the predators wouldn't persist where I'd introduce them. Um, you know, so that had, that was part of the plan, and, and it hasn't happened. Or I should say, I tried to do it, and, and it didn't work. 
it's hard to find the right setting. You know, there are only certain types of manipulations that are easily done, mm -hmm. and we always are trying to do ones that are confined. We don't, you know, I mean, it's changing things, and people are, are a little alarmed that we've done that, but they're, they're minor changes. You know, it's moving animals up and downstream within their own drainage and following patterns of natural colonization that, that we normally would see. Um, and, and that was one that, I, that we, we had hoped to do, but have not done. For your other questions, let's thank David for a wonderful talk. Sure, this is saved. Uh, yeah, the reason I asked that question is um, it's a little different from the lizards and stuff. Trying to figure out why you get. Yeah, 